It's good to have all of you here in service this morning. Greetings in the name of Jesus from Riviera Apostolic Church in Riviera, Texas. Today I want to read a scripture to you, Matthew 25 and 13. It says, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Lord, anoint my words this morning. Yes. Touch us all, my God. Yes. Let your words touch our heart and change our lives. Let revelation begin to grow within us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Everybody said amen. You may be seated. Today I want to speak on the title, Watch and Be Ready. Born on October the 15th, 1887, Frederick Fleet was born in Liverpool, England. He never knew his father, and soon after his birth, his mother abandoned him and ran off with a boyfriend to Springfield, Massachusetts, never to be seen or heard from again by him. In the following years, Fleet was raised by a succession of foster families and distant relatives. And in 1903, at the age of 16, he went to sea as a deck boy, working his way up to able seaman. He sailed for over four years as a lookout on the RMS Oceanic, and as a seaman, Fleet earned five pounds a month, or approximately seven dollars and fifty cents per month, plus an extra five shillings for lookout duty, which was approximately an extra three dollars and seventy-five cents a month for a grand total of about $11.25 per month. On April the 10th, 1912, Fleet boarded the Titanic in Southampton as a newly hired watchman crew member, along with five other watchmen. The ship set sail and made two stops, first in Chabot, France, and then in Queenstown, Ireland, the lookout six in total made two-hour shifts due to the extreme cold in the crow's nest. And the trip was uneventful for a couple of days until the night of the 14th of April, 1912, at 2200 or 10 p.m. Fleet was put on watch duty along with the fellow lookout Reginald Lee. And on that fateful night, history tells us, that the seas were very calm and there was no moon and it was extremely dark. The only sounds to be heard were the sounds of the ship's engines and the sound of the passengers on the ship. Standing there that night, the two men reflected that they had lamented at not having binoculars for there was no reflection to show the icebergs that they had been instructed to look for. It was Fleet who first sighted the icebergs. He immediately rang a bell and screamed, Iceberg right ahead. And the events that would follow that first warning would go down in infamous history forevermore. After the collision, Fleet and Lee remained on duty for 20 more minutes. At 23.39 was when Fleet first spotted the iceberg and rang the nest bell three times to warn the bridge that there was something ahead. Then using the nest telephone, he contacted the bridge and it was answered by the sixth officer, James Paul Moody, who asked Fleet, what did you see? He pronounced the infamous iceberg right ahead warning at that time. Moody passed Fleet's warning to the first officer William McMaster Murdoch, who was in charge of the bridge. Almost immediately afterward, they collided with the massive iceberg. Fleet and his fellow watchman Lee both survived the horrific accident that night. But out of 2,213 souls on board that ship that night, 1,503 lives were lost with only 710 passengers being rescued. History tells us that there was enough 
lifeboats for all of the passengers. <coughs> Many of them weren't full of passengers as they pulled away from the sinking ship. That night, as the orchestra stayed there on the ship playing Nearer My God to Thee, all of them would sink with the ship and lose their lives. The lifeboat that fleet escaped in with his cohort Lee only had three people in it. Fleet later testified at subsequent inquiries that into, into the disaster that if he and Lee had been issued binoculars, he quoted, we could have seen it, the iceberg, a bit sooner. When asked how much sooner, he responded, well enough to get out of the way. Later in life, Lee suffered from depression, possibly in part due to the disaster. And on January 1965, Fleet committed suicide by hanging himself. It is said that as passengers boarded the great Titanic ship, one of the passengers addressed the captain as they boarded and, in, and inquired of how safe the captain thought that this ship really was. And the captain's reply was, Sir, even God himself couldn't sink this ship. As it, impaired, as it prepared to embark upon its maiden voyage, the Titanic was one of the largest and most opulent ships in the world. It had a gross registered tonnage of 46,328 tons. When fully laden, the ship displayed or weighed more than 52,000 tons. The Titanic was approximately 882 and a half feet long and about 92 and a half feet wide at its highest point. But on that inky black infamous night, with a mighty shudder and a low rumbling, almost a fourth of the ship's hull was breached by a rogue iceberg, and the rest is history. Because of the lack of carefully planned watch procedures, eternity slipped up on over 1,500 souls that night. It is said that the man that was in charge of the binoculars left them in a locked closet and left the ship before it sailed with the keys in his pocket. Therefore, they were not able to find the binoculars and issue them to the watch. And so it was with the ten virgins that we read about in the Bible. And in Matthew 25, 13, which I already read to you, I want to add verses 1 through 12. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and they all slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. And the wise answered them, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go rather to them that sell and buy oil for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. 
As they laid down that night, I'm certain that they were tired. It had gotten late. And I'm certain that they thought they had plenty of oil. But five of them had a flask of oil along with their lamps, and five of them did not. I'm sure that the thought popped across their mind that we'll have time later to buy some oil for our lamps, and surely he won't come before we get some more oil if we run out. But as fate would have it, as weariness overtook them, and they laid down to sleep, the bridegroom came. Like many nights before, their activities overtook them, and the oil that they had had gone low. But tonight was different. <coughs> tonight was the night that tomorrow lost. Tomorrow found them left behind. Oh, they had oil now. They had gone and got the oil. And sometimes I wonder, did they light their lamps in hopes that the bridegroom would re re return to, to, to come and get them? Did they wait for a little bit hoping that he would come back? only to run out of oil again and knowing then as the realization struck them that maybe it was too late. Because the Bible says that they then went to him and knocked on the door. But the door had been shut. You see, right now, the Bible says, is the hour <coughs> of salvation. And in Matthew 24, 3 through 14, the Bible says, speaking of Jesus, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when all of these things shall be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. At that time, they didn't realize that it would be thousands of years later. They were under the assumption that the end of times was very near. And they said, what's going to happen? How will we recognize the end times, Lord? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed, listen carefully, that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and he shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted. And shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and they shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. The first thing he told them, he said, take heed. Listen carefully. Pay attention to what I'm fixing to tell you. There are going to be wars in the world and there's going to be rumors of wars to come. Today there are more wars in this world going on than there have ever been before. There are rumors that there are more wars to come. Just this week I heard the rumor 
that China and Russia are coming together and they're going to war against America. And then North Korea is going to go to war against South Korea to draw the United States into a war. And that there is a great possibility that Russia has gone into a war with Ukraine to drain our supplies so that when China decides to come against us, we won't have the supplies to fight them. Rumors of wars. The next thing he said is there will be many that come that say I am Christ. There are so many that will deceive you. There are so many that will tell you they, they have the answer. And there are so many false prophets and, and, and prosperity ministers out there today that don't care one thing about your soul. They just want your money. So many of them have been caught in so many scandals and yet the world blunders on and sleeps on and they get away with it and they keep on and they keep on going and they keep on going. Wolves in sheep's clothing, the Bible calls them. And they are many. The next thing he said is that nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And that is happening throughout the entire world. He said there shall be famines. There is more starvation. I read in the news this past week that one out of, I believe it's three or five children in the world don't get enough food to eat. Famine, pestilence was the next thing that he mentioned. Pestilence, pandemics, trouble, sicknesses, diseases. We have just come out. We've not even really come out of a pandemic that affected the entire world. And is still affecting the entire world. The news media has just stopped reporting on it because of the politics of the liberal media. The next thing was earthquakes in diverse places or earthquakes in many places. We all know of the earthquake that just happened a few weeks ago that killed, I believe it was 60-something thousand people. If you look up how many earthquakes have happened last year, there were more earthquakes than there was ever before in right. history combined. That's right. The Bible says all of these are the beginnings of sorrows. For they will deliver you up to be afflicted. There are so many martyrs and people being persecuted for the name of Jesus today. There's more than there has ever been in, the, in, the, in, in history. More people are being afflicted. More people are being sought after. More people are being betrayed. And the Bible says that we would be hated by all nations for His name's sake. The way this world has gone... If you are a religious person and you are a Christian, a true Christian, taking a stand for biblical principles, moral principles, God-given ways that have been established in the Word of God, then you are hated by people in all nations of this world. It says, many shall be offended. I have never in my lifetime ever heard so so many people say, don't offend anyone. Just accept everything. Put up with everything. Don't, don't speak against anything. Everybody has the right to do whatever they want to. But biblically, that's not true. Correct. Right. And biblically, if you take a stand, you offend many people today. 
The Bible says people shall betray one another and they shall hate one another. There has never been a time in my life or in history that we have seen so much hatred in the world. It seems that every day you hear of mass shootings and mass killings and, and people driving into crowds with vehicles and, and bombs and, and so much hatred in the world. The Bible says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. There is so much iniquity in this world. There are so many perversions and so many deviations from the Word of God. There is very little love in this world. They'll speak of love, but too many people mistake love for sexual contact. It has nothing to do with that. There is very little love, true love, in this world. The Bible says that when this beautiful and wonderful gospel is preached in all nations, then shall the end come. With the onslaught of technology in recent times, we now have the ability to reach this world worldwide, no matter where someone is. We have the ability to reach into their lives through the internet and through computers. We have the ability to preach the gospel and to be a witness unto all nations. The end is near. Jesus Christ is coming back and he's coming back soon. I don't want to be left behind. Right. I don't want to be the one that turns on the television set the next morning and hears that thousands and hundreds of thousands of people across this world have just disappeared and they believe that it may have been what nobody ever believed could happen and that's the second, second coming of Jesus Christ God Almighty. But whether that happens or not, we have to be ready. For none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. Our end could be today. And would we be ready? Would we hear him say, well done, or depart from me, I don't know you? Are we a friend of God's? Do we carry God with us? Do we reflect his image? Are we a witness? I'm reminded of the story of the young lady. She was a teenager and she was in, in denial of what she should be doing. And in a fit of rebellion, she went for a joy ride to a party with some of her friends. And her mother, in a frenzied panic, ran after her and said, Honey, I don't want you to go, but if you do, please take Jesus with you. And laughingly, she got in the car and said, Well, if Jesus is going to ride in this car, you better get in the trunk because there's too many people up front. That car was in an automobile accident several miles down the road and when they got there they couldn't recognize what kind of car it was. But as they opened the trunk, they said there was a dozen eggs in the trunk and not one of them was broken. Everyone in the car was killed. The door was shut. Don't shut that door today. Because the Bible says that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and married and giving in marriage. They were partying. And Noah was out there. He'd heard from God. And God said, I want you to build an ark. And I want you to make it this size and these dimensions. And I want it to look like this. And I want it to be out of this wood. And I want this this pitch to be covered. I want exactly everything done the way I tell you to do it. So Noah began to build the ark. Him and his family in the Bible records that it was about a hundred years that he worked on that ark. The whole time he's working on that ark, he's telling everyone it's going to rain. It had never rained. The earth had always been watered by the dew. But he said it's going to rain. They laughed at him. They mocked him. 
They laugh at us today. They mock us. Finally, the time come when God led the animals to the ark and they began to go into the ark and the people were amazed by that, but they still didn't believe that it would rain for it had never rained. They don't believe today that Jesus is coming back for they have never seen him. But he is. Right. His word is forever established in heaven. And he never changes. And he never lies. Finally on that day, the Bible says that Noah took his family and walked into that ark. And the Bible says that God shut the door. Right. As it began to rain and the waters began to rise, people began to gather. For over a hundred years now, they've heard this old man out there and he's been preaching, it's going to rain. You need to get in the ark. God's going to flood the world. You need to get in the ark. Sin is fixed to, this is fixed to be retribution. God's fixed to stop it. You, you, you need to hear what I'm saying. You need to get in the ark. But nobody believed it. The Bible records that there was a great flood and everyone was killed except for Noah and his family. My friend, eternity is nothing to take for granted and be haphazard about because eternity is real and you will spend eternity somewhere, right. either in heaven or in hell. And God is calling you today. If you can hear the sound of my voice, God is calling and he is reaching for you today for it is not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There is a better life. There is a better way. And it is Jesus. Right. Don't let the devil distract you from what you need to do. Don't let him cause you to turn aside because he will purchase your soul for the cheapest price that he can pay. It doesn't matter what your temptation is. He will custom make that temptation for you. That's what he does. That's what he's done for thousands of years. And he's good at his job. But he's not as good as Jesus is at saving your soul. If you will let him. The devil will destroy you if you let him. Right. Sin only has pleasure for a season. And then comes death. Both spiritually and physically. But with Jesus there is life and joy everlasting. Today you can leave this building changed and ready for whatever comes your way. Today, you can try Jesus. For only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Right. Only He can cleanse your heart and make you whole. He'll give you peace you never knew. <clears throat> Love and joy in heaven too. For only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Make your way to an altar today and turn your life over to Him. Repent and tell Him that you're sorry for what you've done and that you want to live for Him. Be baptized in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ and then let Him fill your soul with the gift of the Holy Ghost because it's for you. Today, it is for you and it is without reservations. Nothing you've done, nothing you've said, nowhere that you have gone or been, nothing you haven't said, done, gone, will keep him from saying, come home, my child. It's time to stop wondering. It's time to stop being lost. It's time to live in my house. It's time to eat at my table. It's time for the Father is waiting for you. It is yours. Just come home to Jesus. That's all it takes. Today, as I stand here before you, the Bible says that it is such a simple plan that the wise would be confounded. But it is so complex. It is a fool can't err. 
Why is people with their education says it can't, they get that, that can't be right? But a child can understand it. It's a simple plan of salvation. It doesn't take anything. It just takes you wanting to change the way you are and the way you live and to be right with God. For Him to fill you with His presence and to fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. It'll change your life. It'll change your eternity. Let's stand this morning. Lord Jesus, we have come before you today. Lord, let the words of my mouth be anointed. Let it reach out to somebody, Lord, with conviction and with revelation. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any questions, please go to our website, revereapostolicchurch.org, and get in touch with us. And we will get back in touch with you. And if you can't come to this church, we will find you a church to go to. God bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you.